If you have never experienced a near suicidal depressive breakdown, I can tell you what it's like. I had one five years ago. Now, hopefully this isn't you, but looking back, I know it was the best thing that could have happened to me. Because up till then, I was just like every other clueless entrepreneur, maniacally focused on success, but ignoring all the signs, moving nonstop from one guru get-rich scheme to another, yet still completely in the dark about what I was supposed to do with my life. But as they say, that was then, this is now, and if you can hear my voice, then you and I both know we are ready to get serious about living the life we love, not just existing in it. But how do we do it? Join me as I work with hundreds of entrepreneurs just like you to learn their insider secrets, what's working now, and more importantly, what hasn't. All to help you, the struggling entrepreneur, decode what's keeping you stuck, enabling you to live better, accomplish more, and truly become the person you want to be. Hi, my name is Brian Forsyth, and welcome to Radically Unstuck. All right, all right, all right. Hey, welcome to Radically Unstuck. My name is Brian Forsyth. I want to remind you, this is not just... This is not just a podcast. This is not just a show. This is a movement in the moment. The moment you decide that you are ready to start living a life, start moving towards the life that you would gladly fight for. That is the purpose of this podcast. That is the dream that I have for you. And with that, I want to I want to bring on my my guest, Diane Wingert. Uh, as you will find out, she has quite an interesting story. She has done many different things. She is going to bring highly actionable uh, advice and introspection based on a, a, a life, a full life lived. And with that, go ahead, Diane, and, and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, why you do what you do. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Brian, for doing what you do and for inviting me. So thank I, you. yeah, you're welcome. I am a coach and mentor to women with ADHD, and for those that don't know the acronym, it's also called ADD, which is Attention Deficit Disorder. The reason why I do that is that most women who have this don't even know it. They know something's different about them. They don't know what it is, including me, until very late in life. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Even 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 though I was a former therapist, I still didn't know that this was me. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad you found out because that, that can be um, incredibly challenging. And, and uh, you know, I, I know that, you know, if somebody had told me when I was very young that, uh, you know, that I suffered, that I was on the autistic uh, spectrum, it would have helped me a lot. And speaking of, of, of being young, um, you know, definitely have had a, an amazing life and, and uh, you know, doing a, doing fantastic work. And I, I thank you for that. Um, what, um, what I want to talk about is when you were younger, you know, 15 or 16 years old, did you always, you know, want to be doing this? Nope. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, so you, no, no, you wanted no. to be a real estate agent, didn't no, you? No, I didn't want to do that either. I'll tell you, I, I grew up in a family in a, in a nice neighborhood in Southern California. And from the outside, our, our family looked good. It was in a good neighborhood, a safe neighborhood, a, a prosperous neighborhood. Um, there were a number of kids in the family, I had a stay at home mom and a dad that uh, worked in aerospace as an engineer. So we were better off than many. That's for sure. But what went on on the inside was a totally different picture that nobody knew about. Most of us kids were adopted, including me, adopted at birth, private adoptions. And uh, we were all sort of thrown together as this uh, family. And this was back at a time when there was no birth control pill. There was no legalized abortion. And so girls who, Mm -hmm. as they said, then got themselves in a family way, of course, they didn't get themselves in that way, um, were often desperate to find a solution to an unwanted pregnancy. So the parents Mm -hmm. that adopted me had a pretty easy time acquiring as many kids as they wanted. Unfortunately, um, the dad, being an engineer, was never home, and the mom was both mentally unstable and abusive. So that was my childhood environment. Now, I was lucky to be uh, a child who turned out to be very resilient, 
And unfortunately, not all of the kids in the family were, but I was able to recognize the signs when uh, my mom was going to be, you know, becoming abusive. And most of the time I could protect myself and the other kids. Now, you can see how that could easily lead to a career as a therapist. But when I was uh, a teenager, I realized that I had overcome my shyness. I had overcome my insecurity and low self-esteem. And what I really wanted to do was be either a journalist or go like investigative journalism because I'm super nosy and I like asking questions, which also was good for yeah. therapy. But that kind of worked out, huh? Yeah, it did. I, I was able to parlay those skills and traits in a different way, but I really, really wanted to be either a journalist and do investigative reporting and travel all over the world and stick my microphone in front of people's faces and get the goods. Or I wanted to go into the advertising industry because I always had a way with words and I can always tell what a good marketing campaign was going to be. And I thought that would be a fun, creative, exciting thing to do. Well, I don't know if you remember your high school guidance counselor, as I guess they're probably still called, but I remember saying, hey, I, I'm really curious. Uh, I love learning. I, I love meeting new people. And I really think it would be very exciting for me to go into journalism or advertising. And my guidance counselor said, you don't want to do that. Oh, man. Now, the interesting thing about someone who really doesn't know you, like, now, mind you, I had lousy parents. Like, my mother was very abusive, and my dad was never around. And when he was around, he could literally be sitting calmly reading the newspaper while she would be beating one or more of the kids nearby and just not intervene. So when an adult... And, and nobody so, ever and nobody ever noticed. No. Like, and you the, never, there was... No, no, no social services ever got involved. No neighbors ever reported anything. Um, we lived in an upper middle class community. And I think, you know, I realized uh, there were privileges, obviously, um, mm. because it was safe. It, you know, we always had enough to eat. We always had clothes to wear and stuff. It, there was never, we didn't have poverty or anything like that. But um, in our neighborhood, I think, uh, you know, a, a upper middle class neighborhood, neighbors don't report on each other. They just kind of mind their own business. So what uh, I learned is the adults can't be trusted. You're on um, your own and you just need to get through this and get the heck out of here, which because I was a good student, I set my sights on I need to get out of here. I need to go to college. I need to get a career path. I need to be able to support myself because I knew my parents uh, weren't, weren't going to help me. So when an adult advisor tells me, you don't want to do that, um, hmm. I was like, well, really? Why? And the guidance counselor said, well, first of all, those jobs are very unstable. You'll never be able to support yourself. And secondly, advertising. Well, first of all, have you ever been to New York? Because you're going to have to move to New York. And if you go into advertising, <laughs> everybody in the advertising field has been divorced multiple times, and they're all alcoholics. Is that what you want? And I was like, oh, uh, my. I'm like, uh, and I'm thinking now I would be, how can you say that to a teenager? You know? But now, but at that Talk time, about black and like, white thinking. Oh my, well, not only that, I think that was a little bit of projection from maybe some personal experience, but Ooh. I said, oh. Here's oh. a psychology book, buddy. Right. And I said, okay, uh, okay, well, then I guess, yeah, then I guess I don't want to do that. But you know what? It, it really helps me understand now at this stage of my life that, that kids oftentimes really know who they are. But the adults in their life talked them out of it. And that was exactly what happened to me. So there I was like, oh, shoot, shoot it's pretty soon it's time to apply. And you, you kind of have to have some idea of what you're applying for. So I knew that my adoptive mother, um, she had dropped out of school in the sixth grade. She couldn't even spell. That's how I ended up with the funny spelling of my first name. She didn't actually know how to spell Diane. And that's a true oh, wow. story. So I thought, well, if I'm not going to go into what I thought I was going to go into, what am I going to do? And I knew that 
she never completed her education, so she couldn't act on the dream that she had, which was to be a nurse. Mm. So I decided, you know, um, that would probably make her happy and proud if I became a nurse. So I decided I would start volunteering as a, I don't know what they're called now, but then they were called candy stripers. So I became a candy striper. I started volunteering in a local hospital and I thought, okay, well now I know what I'm going to do. And even though it really didn't come from me, I felt like I needed a plan and a path. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't going to be the one that I thought it was, then okay, so be it. It'll be this. And I always try to excel because when you can't get your self-esteem from your family, you have to find something else you're good at. And I was good at learning and my teachers liked an eager student. So I got really hooked on being a good student and learning and Mm. doing well and getting good grades, which has helped me a lot. But um, anyway, I, I applied to go to UCLA and I actually, uh, the night before I was going to submit my application to the nursing program. I did all my prerequisites. I even had talked my way into being the first pre-nursing student on the Student Nurses Association of California organization. I said, don't you folks have any pre-nursing students representing that group? They're like, no, would you like to be the first? And I'm like, sure. So I was all set. I'm sure I was going to be accepted. Right? I'm sure I was going to be accepted, but literally the night before I was going to submit my application, I just kept procrastinating and procrastinating. And I was like, what is the matter? You're going to get in. This is what you're going to do. And I thought, I'm not a nurse. I'm just yeah, not. Because I hate blood and I hate bugs. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just right. not a nurse. It, it just was not the right path for me. But, you know, when you've got yourself all queued up to do something and you've convinced yourself it's the thing, and then all of a sudden you get real honest with yourself and mm-hmm. think, mm, this isn't it. Okay, honesty is good. We like honesty. But the very next thought is, then what am I going to do? And I had no clue. No clue. Did you want to join the army? Like, did, did the military ever come through your mind? <laughs> oh. You know, because uh, in my I'm opinion, not- there are uh, many people who, you know, have have quite a lot of problems um, that they are you know trying to get away from in one form or the other that go into the military. And, and uh, so I was just... Kind of curious about that. No, I would agree with you, Brian. A lot of people um, who have dysfunctional families, if you will, abusive families, alcoholic families, and so forth, a lot of them go into the military because the family either doesn't have the means to send them to college or they don't feel like they're college material. And uh, in many states, you can enlist in the military before you're even 18 years old and have the legal right to determine you know, your future. So it's, it's either for a lot of girls, it's get married to the first guy that asks uh, or get pregnant and pressure someone into marrying you or hop on the military bus. In my neighborhood, everybody went to college. So that was what was modeled. And that was really the only path I considered. So you're, um, so you're, you're in that moment of truth and you're not going to be a nursing student clearly. Nope. So where, where did, where did we go from there? It was so painful. I'll be honest with you. I literally, you know, I was already at UCLA I was uh, working part-time in the student store. I was doing well in my classes and I was all queued up to go to nursing school. But, you know, by the time you're finishing your sophomore year, you have to declare a major and you have to start on that path towards graduation. You can't just keep exploring. You cannot be undeclared at that university. So at that point was like, well, you have to choose another path and you got to do it tonight. (laughs) So I literally, So, what was your, like, what was your, like, now that you're away from your parents, right? You're away from that environment. Like what, what was that like? Like the first day you were at the, at the college and you're just like, you're not at the, 
the dysfunctional, you know, um, party of, of seven, you, yeah. you know, you're like, what was that like? Well, I think what, what I felt immediately was relief. You know, when I found out I got into UCLA, no one in my family celebrated. No one even said congratulations. No one said we're proud of you. Um, nobody said, oh, wow. where are you going to get the money from? Like, I, I didn't even know where I was going to get the money from. Um, so it was just, I didn't have a plan because I never really had anyone sort of tell me how to make a plan. And, and I think something I've learned from having been a therapist for many years and working with a lot of young people from all types of families, um, when you're a kid and your parents are very inadequate, either because they they have so many problems of their own, they, they can't help you, or they're neglectful or they're abusive, but whatever the reason is, you, you don't have those adult guides, if you will. A couple of things tend to happen in your personality. You either tend to go towards the path of being a, a dependent person who oftentimes finds themselves in one abusive relationship after the next because they see themselves as, needy and weak and damaged. And so they kind of latch on to people who tell them what to do and push them around and, and they become dependent and that's sort of their path. Then the other type, like me, tends to think, well, shoot, I, I don't have anybody to tell me what to do. I've got to figure it all out on my own. And I did figure some things out on my own. But what I realized many years later is that when you grow up without any guidance, you desperately need it, but you don't want it anymore. Because a big part mm. of your identity develops around this thought, I'm on my own. i got to figure this out on my own. I am on my own. I am by myself. It is up to me to make my way in the world. So it's not that I didn't need mentors. I didn't need guidance. I didn't need wise counsel. I didn't need some advice. It never even occurred to me to seek it out because I was so, my personality had formed so much around this thought that I'm on my own. I got to figure this out myself. Now there, there's good mm. things and bad things about that. The good things is that I'm incredibly resourceful. I'm very resilient. I'm highly adaptable. And I have figured a lot of things out on my own. What's bad about it is I don't always recognize when I need help. I'm extremely reluctant to ask for it. And I almost never take advantage of it when it's offered. So here I was, like, I got to figure out a new major. It never occurred to me to try to find another guidance counselor or sign up for some kind of a session with someone or even ask any of the other students. I literally stayed up all night going through the college catalog and literally mm. going from one major after the next math. Nope. Chemistry. Nope. You know, <laughs> literally it was a process of elimination. I'm with you. No math for me. No, thanks. no, no, no. It was a process of elimination. Can I do that? Um, would I even be able to, to manage the classes? And then I just kept whittling down the list until I got to the point where there were a few things that I, I could be successful at and I could, stomach. And what I eventually came down to was uh, communications. And what's interesting is that would have been the perfect major for someone going into journalism or advertising. It was a brand new major at the time. They were only going to accept 50 people, about 350 people applied. And I thought, well, I like to talk. My verbal skills are probably my best, you know, most developed trait. So I'll figure out something I can do with this. And I applied and I got in. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's cool. So you're one of 50. I was one of 50. So that was good. And I, it was so, it was very interesting, Brian, to study. Um, we sort of had to either go towards mass communication or interpersonal communication. And that was a hard choice for me to make because mass communication would have definitely taken me towards advertising, journalism, media, public relations, things like that. And that would have probably eventually led me toward the thing that I wanted to do several years earlier in high school. 
but I just kept thinking about what that guidance counselor told me. And I knew I didn't want to be an alcoholic. And I, knew I, didn't want to be divorced, and I didn't know anything about New York. So I'm like, no, 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 you're not. You better go with interpersonal communication instead of mass communication. Because if you do mass communication and then you don't get a job in media, it kind of won't make sense. But we got to study all sorts of interesting things. And I think for someone who is a communicator by nature, it was a very good fit. I learned a lot. I enjoyed it a lot. But the four years I went through college just seemed to zip by really quick. And then all of a sudden, there I was with my brand new degree from UCLA in communication with zero idea of what I was actually going to do when I graduated and had to get a job. No idea whatsoever. So, so four years and UCLA, right? We're not talking like, like I went to the University of Memphis, used to be called Memphis, uh, Memphis State, you know, but you know, University of Memphis sounds so much better. Uh, but, um, so you graduated from UCLA and, you know, this is a, this is a pretty, you know, top flight school. After four years, do you feel like, you know, standing on the other end that, because right now college is changing, college is going to change the whole concept of what college is and the next 10 years, yeah. uh, you know, in my opinion is going to be just like, you won't even recognize it, right? Most of these colleges will, they'll be like monuments yeah. to education. They won't be educational centers anymore. But so you're standing on the other side of, of a degree from UCLA and you're thinking this was worth it <laughs> or man, this was, I should have, I should have went to New York. <laughs> like, no, what, what were you thinking? I wasn't thinking either of those things. I was thinking, what the heck just happened? These four years literally <laughs> just flew by. See, I think I was always just so focused on surviving which is why the message of your podcast resonates so much with me and why I was eager to become a guest because you want more for your listeners than just surviving. And I had always just been focused on surviving my mother's abuse, surviving to the age of 18 so I could get out of there. Some of the kids ran away. I have no idea what happened to them. So I, oh, wow. I just needed to get, and frankly, several of them were sent back and unadopted but that that's a very sad oh, and, and scary story we won't go into but i was the survivor i was the number one most resilient i'm getting the heck out of here of course i had a lot of survivor guilt because i couldn't save any of the other kids i could only save me um but after college when i had no clue what i was going to do i literally i couldn't go back home that was not an option I didn't have any. You didn't really have a home there. No, there was no home. There, there was there was a home. I had an me. address, but there was no home no, there. No, no, no. That was not even an option. And so uh, I I don't know what I thought I was going to do. Maybe I thought I was going to get married. Maybe I just, I really had no clue. I, I never really thought it through. I was just trying to survive. And then all of a sudden it was over. And I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? And literally took a job at a fitness center. Um, I don't know if you remember Nautilus fitness equipment, but uh, came out in the 80s. I don't even know if it's still around anymore, but it was kind of a hot thing then. It was brand new because at that point, the only people that went to a gym were like, you know, the, the gyms were like the grunt and sweat places with the big muscly dudes with tattoos and stuff. And women didn't go there yeah. and, and, you know, normal people didn't go there. But Nautilus was a 20-minute workout with these machines that were very easy to figure out how to use. So the intimidation factor of going to the gym was minimized. And, of course, I lived in Southern California where everybody wants to look good and be in shape. So I went to work at this place with my brand-new college degree as a trainer which doesn't even require you to graduate from high school. Of course, I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I was like, what am I doing here? But I thought, well, this is temporary and I'm just going to be here while I figure it out. But the little overachiever that I always was, 
about 10 days after I started working there, you know, I was just always walking around and noticing things that I had questions about, or why are you doing it this way? Or I can think of a better way to do this. And so I just asked if I could meet with uh, the owner because I had made some observations that I thought might be helpful for ways to improve the club. And he, he was amusing me like this 22 year old girl who, what does she know? Right. And I, I could see from the, right. I could see from the look on his face, he didn't take me seriously. He probably just thought maybe I was cute. He'd sit down with me for 15 minutes and then throw me out of his office. So I sat down and I said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a compulsive fixer and a bit of a perfectionist. And so I, I'm, I can't help myself. I'm always just noticing how things could be better. So I'd like to share this list with you. And I started just reading. It was like on a legal pad. And I just started reading one thing after the next. Um, I got through like a page and a half and there were like seven pages. And <laughs> he said, would you wait here for a second? And I was surprised. I had no idea. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll wait here. He gets up, goes out of the office and closes the door, goes out. I see him talking to the manager. I see an argument take place. I see the manager go to his desk and throw some things in a cardboard box and then go storming out of the building. And the owner comes in and sits down and says, how would you like to be the manager? And I was so confused. I I, I was like, what's happening? I just started feeling so anxious. And I said, "Um, we have a manager. He goes, not anymore unless you want to be. And yeah, so I was like, it, it was a sort of an interesting moment because instead of thinking, wow, you're so good that you literally just got promoted after 10 days. I thought, oh my God, I just caused someone to lose their job. You sound a lot like my wife. Mm. <laughs> like my wife, she's, she's a, you know, she's an amazing lady, but you know, she's just, she's just got that heart, you know, like she, me, I'm like, I'm not that dude. Like I'd be feeling like if I had just walked in and just got me a job based on the fact that, you know, and somebody had to lose their job to me, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's reality. But for her, I feel like she, she would also have come home and said, baby, I got this job, but this guy just fired this dude like on the spot. Like, you know, so I think there I may feel be, like you and her yeah, are very similar. I think there may be some genuine gender differences. One of the things I coach on now a great deal is confidence and how much discomfort women have with ambition and jealousy and professional envy and it's there's a lot that's been written about the fact that uh, a man and you, what you just said has validated this. A man will apply for a job when he meets 50% or more of the criteria. He can talk his way in the interview. And, and this is, of course, not all men. This is, a, this is a, a, a generalization. But there was a very interesting article several years ago in Atlantic that uh, they said if a man meets you know, 50% or better of the criteria for a position, he'll go ahead and apply and think he's got a shot. A woman, in general, will not apply unless she meets 100% of the criteria. And even then, if she gets the job, she thinks she was lucky. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, that is something. um, That's one of the things that I really wish, you know, we we as a culture did better. instilling into into women you know into these young girls and that they have so much more power that they're so much more worthy yeah you know that that they are deserving you know but it's it's a weird thing that you know somehow or the other our culture and our machine as it were is teaching women to to maintain that reality Mm -hmm. and to and to literally brian i think our culture conditions women to hold back play small and literally withhold their brilliance from the world out of the misguided belief 
that it will make others feel bad, be uncomfortable, and that it means something negative about them that they um, show themselves in all their work. I do a lot of work with women now about reclaiming their confidence because I think children are born confident. And if a little boy, you know, creates a, a little tower out of blocks and he shows it to his parents and they say, you're a builder, son. Look at what you just made, even though it probably looks totally <laughs> lame. But if a girl says, look at what I did, they'll say, okay, now, don't, don't, you don't want to be too proud of yourself. That's arrogant. You know, just don't, don't be bossy. Don't promote yourself. Don't be arrogant. Don't be conceited. I remember hearing a lot of those messages as a kid and thinking, I think I'm pretty smart. So why can't I say I did a good job and, and, and feel deserving of a compliment? I have deflected compliments my whole life, as do most women I know, because we're told if someone says, you're really smart or you're pretty or I like how you did that, that you're supposed to say, oh, you know what, it, 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 it's really not that good. Look at all the mistakes I made. That's messed up. So my, I'm curious, though, because you, you're doing you're doing, um, you know, coaching and counseling now. So I'm curious whether that whether you're still seeing that in the, I mean, do you, do you coach anybody who's, you know, 25, you know, 30 years old, that's, that's not in our, uh, you know, uh, age bracket as it were, like, do you see, do you still see the same kind, same things coming through with the, with the younger kids and, and adults? I'm, I'm, that's a really good question, Brian. Thank you for asking that. Uh, what I see is I coach people, I coach females, who are adults. So some of my clients are in their 20s, some in their 30s, some 40s, some 50s. And I currently have a client who's 68. I work with women who have specific types of goals and they are the right fit for me regardless of age. I have been encouraged, I'll be honest with you, that more of the younger women I work with have an easier time of developing confidence and and letting go of any sense of shame about being proud of themselves. The older women in their fifties and sixties, it oftentimes mm. takes a lot more work to let that stuff go and feel okay about it. One of the concepts I teach is called radical self-acceptance. And uh, we all have things about ourselves that we are ashamed of, or we think are wrong with us. But I think the younger women seem to have an easier time of embracing that and, and being willing to the older women somehow feel like I'd like to think that, but, but I feel kind of guilty about it. And I think it's also just how long your brain has been thinking the same thoughts, um, mm -hmm. that how much of a fight the brain will put up to change those thoughts. Yeah. One of the things that, that I talk about a lot is the fact that the brain for all the the wonderful things that it it does, you know, many of many of which we don't actually have to pay any attention to, it's very lazy. Yeah, and, and it is, and it's always trying to conserve resources. Yeah. and and what that means is, you really have to work at, you know, uncreating, you know, really what essentially are pathways which was your thoughts and also your habits yep. and your habits of thought. And so, you know, that I wish that I could get that to more people. This, this is so important, especially if kids could be taught your, one of the podcast episodes I released recently is called your brain is not your friend. And you know, <laughs> because here's the thing, you and I think the same about this, Brian. The truth is your brain is not your friend. Your brain has one job, which it does very well, but its standards are low. That job is to keep you alive. It does not care if you're happy. It does not care if you're fulfilled. It does not care if you're living your dream. It only cares if you're still breathing and if your ticker is still ticking. And that's because it's a lazy mofo that doesn't want to burn any calories by thinking new thoughts, feeling new feelings, and taking new actions. It is hard work to motivate the brain. It can be done, but 
there's no automatic overnight success with that. You know, if you've been thinking, I'm stupid, I'm lazy, I'm boring, I'm ugly, whatever it is that you you are thinking about yourself for 20, 30, 40 plus years, that's going to take some work to delete those tapes and install some new ones. That's something that really I hope that the people listening can can take on because if you're if you're a, a beginning entrepreneur and you're trying to you know especially if you have another job and you're doing your your moonlighting gig and you're trying to to build this this lifestyle this business product whatever it is you have got to take this on board yeah because this means that you, that this is the reason why you have to be kind to yourself. You have to you know be radically patient with yourself mm-hmm. in a, in a lot of instances because patience is the one thing that the developing entrepreneur, the you know the struggling entrepreneur, especially when there's like a economic you know reality yeah. that they're that they're fighting against. Patience is the hardest, but it's the most important. If you're ever trying to do anything. You have to be patient because you have to you have to realize that there's going to be failures, there's going to be setbacks, and you know if you don't have any patience, then every mistake is this five alarm fire. Yes, and you know, and that's really what drove me to my, you know, to my um, depressive breakdown for the most part, is that I was under so much stress. I mean, I was literally surviving on four hours of sleep a night. You know, I, I was in the Navy. I'm going to the Navy. I'm waking up at 530. I'm going to bed at sometimes 12, getting up at, you know, 430. I'm getting like maybe four and a half hours of sleep sometimes. And even then, when I come home, I'm sleeping for an hour on the couch, literally just exhausted. And and eventually that, that, that you know, I cracked. Yeah. And so, you know, I hope that the people listening, you know, take this on board and and really you know, you have to have to be able to, you know, and, and what do you what do you think are some of the ways that patience is easier when you're when you're moving through these these life changes that you're trying to to bring about? I think there's a couple of things that I like to remind people of. Uh, it, it doesn't make it faster, but I think it can help you hang in there long enough to make it work. And that is this. If you are thinking, I'm not going to make it. This is too hard. I don't have what it takes. I'm not making any money. Everybody's ahead of me. All of these things. It doesn't mean they're true just because you're thinking them. I think just knowing that whatever thoughts your brain is serving up, they're probably not true. It's just your brain putting up a fight because you're trying to evolve yourself in your situation in life. You know, the brain accepts an identity pretty early on in life. So if you grew up poor, you're going to have to work hard to believe you deserve to have more. If you have grown up not doing well in school, You might think, I'm not very smart. I don't have what it takes to be successful. And if your brain is serving up that thought, you may think, well, that's just the reality. Like, who am I kidding? Why am I even trying this? Just because you're thinking, it doesn't make it so. And I think just really being able to wrap your mind around that and wrap your mind around the fact that if you have been working for someone else your whole life, I didn't start working for myself till I was 55 years old. You get conditioned to following the rules, meeting other people's expectations, having a boss tell you what to do, having a boss tell you if you're good enough at what you do, all of that. Once you start working for yourself, whether it's a side hustle or how you make your living, you have to replace all those things and take them on yourself. That is takes not only work and effort to change your mindset, but you literally are transforming your identity in the process and making your self-image into that of someone who is an entrepreneur. So I think that that can't be overstated. It's, um, you know, I also think it's not helpful to compare yourself to other people 
because every yes. every human being I have literally ever met always thinks everyone is doing better than them, is further ahead than them, has an easier time than them. It's just not true. You are intimately acquainted with all your struggles. All you're seeing of them is the glossy marketing that they do so that you think it comes easily. It's not so. Um, if I could share a resource, this is a free resource that it it's a, a way to help yourself along transforming the identity, reformatting your brain and giving yourself better thoughts to think. And that's an app that you can get on your phone. I believe it's available for both iOS and Android. It's called Think Up. It's a little orange icon with a little white sprig of something on it. There's a paid version you don't need, but the free version you can record in your own voice. I think four or five affirmations. Affirmations have been around a long time. Oh, that is awesome. But they work. And here's the thing. You're going to love this, Brian. Because you are recording the affirmations, and they have a bunch of examples. You can use one of theirs, some of theirs, or you can come up with your own. Because it's your own voice, your brain doesn't resist it as much as if it's someone else's voice. So if you like to listen to you know, affirmations that other people record, they help. But in your own voice, they help more. And I like to do it in a sneaky way. I say, while you're getting ready in the morning, you're feeding the pets, you're making your kids lunch, you're brewing your coffee, just have it playing in the background. And also at night when you're getting ready, you're winding down. It's almost subliminal. And you literally start changing your thoughts for the better with very little effort. But you got to do it every day. Oh, yeah. That is awesome. I'm definitely going to check that. Uh, that app out. I'm for sure going to be recommending it to to all my peoples. And speaking of recommending all my peoples and contacts and apps, where can we uh, find out more about you, Diane Wingert? Well, my website is dianewingertcoaching.com. And because my first and last name are both probably not spelled the way you'd expect, you probably want to pop those in the show notes. And I have been coaching women with ADHD challenges who are self-employed for last few years, ever since I gave up my therapy practice and moved to another state. But I've always been doing it one-on-one. And now I realize I need to have group programs so that I can help more people and also provide that community feel. So this fall, I'm also going to be offering group coaching. And if there's anyone in your audience that thinks they might be interested in that, If I give you the link, you can also put that in the show notes. They can get on the wait list for more information. I will do that for sure. Definitely um, check the, check the show notes. It'll be there when this, when this podcast airs. And, um, Oh, can I tell you one more thing? Can I tell you one more thing? Oh, sure. I I launched my own podcast in May and it's specifically kind of an inspirational, motivational, very short direct and to the point um the episodes are under 15 minutes and it's called the driven woman oh we need we need some of that i'm gonna tell you um i have had so much experience with you know truthfully broken women and um in in most cases it it wasn't their fault they they lived a hellish um, childhood and were living a hellish reality when i met them so I'm all for empowering women and, and helping women grow, you know, as these beautiful, amazing creatures that, that they are, you know, whether they realize it or not. And I, I like to be an example of that, too. I, I like to be an example that where you started doesn't matter. I started in a very ugly place. And um, I, I healed and transformed. And every day I just try to help more people do the same. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, why, that's really one of the reasons for this podcast is to give, you know, give a platform to the people that, you know, people ask me like, well, well you know, I'll do this, I'll do this. Like, am I, you know, can I come on your podcast? And I'm like, do you want to help people? Like, do you want to use your lived experience to help people? 
then you can, you can come on my podcast, man. Like, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. Like if you want to, if you want to help people, then here's a place for you. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, well, thank you for having the integrity to, to hold out for that because there's, there's plenty of people who are out there just, selling their wares and they really don't care about people and uh, those of us that do need to help one another. So thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about my story. And, uh, and if there's anybody that, you know, connects with that and thinks I'm able to be able to help them, I'd be blessed to do that. Oh, definitely check her out. And um, I just have one, one thing left to say. I really, mm-hmm. I really appreciate, uh, you know, you, the listener uh, being on this journey of, uh, this podcast journey as it were with me and, and do me a favor and hit this link rate this podcast.com forward slash unstuck. Please leave me a review. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you don't. It'll help us out a lot. And with that, thank you again, Diane. You're awesome. This is a great podcast. I look forward to talking to you again, Brian. Yes, ma'am. I said, ma'am, look at that. All right. Peace, y'all. Oh, that's all right. I don't, hey, listen, nobody, nobody out West talks like that. I love it. You keep doing that. <laughs> it's that, it's being, in, being in the Navy. That's what happened. I was in the Navy for 20 oh, it's years. Nice. It's and, nice. uh, and from the South too, right? Yes, ma'am. Yep. I see, oh. ma'am. I don't know what's up with that. No, I love it. No, no, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, you don't need to change. You don't need to change. All right. So uh, with that, I, I thank uh, thank you for being on. I, I I really appreciate you being on and bringing the bringing the love, bringing the the uh, your story and your and your heart. And um, with that, peace, everybody. <laughs>